All right, thanks for joining us for CESC this year, uh, not in person, but remotely, as is the case uh, around the world at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, I'm an economics professor at the University of New South Wales uh, after spending about a decade in the US. And I'm gonna to present to you today a paper uh, with Anoop Milani, who's a former colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. Uh, and it's a bit of an unusual paper for this kind of talk in a sense, because it's a survey paper about a relatively nascent or emerging literature on the law and economics of blockchain. Um, but it's going to provide an overview of a number of different areas of law um, and how they're grappling with, if you like, the economics of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So the starting point for this, and I don't need to press this point too hard, I expect, with, with this audience, is that blockchain or DLT um, has a really wide range of commercial and practical applications, and that's becoming clearer and clearer over time. Um, that also creates uh, both opportunities and challenges for a number of legal doctrines that were set up and established without, those, uh, without this technology being in mind for obvious reasons. Uh, and as I said a, a few minutes ago, uh, this talk's based on a forthcoming paper which should be coming out next year in the Annual Review of Law and Social Sciences. And we want to look at a number of different subfields of law and think about how they adapt or need to adapt or are adapting to blockchain and how designers of uh, technology that utilises DLT uh, might want to be mindful of various uh, legal doctrines. So. Our overarching perspective is that legal rules create economic incentives that govern behaviour and economic activity. And with our economist hat on, uh, we're ultimately interested in uh, what form and uh, what level of economic activity takes place as a result of that and, and whether those legal rules and institutions can be designed in a better and more effective way to, to, to lead to more, more economic output. OK, um, now, since the technology itself is relatively new, the legal rules are playing catch up a little bit. And so some of this stuff is very much emerging. Now, I'm not going to provide references to many papers during the talk, um, but obviously the uh, actual paper itself uh, is going to be as a as a survey paper is going to be littered with, you know, 100 odd references. So they'll be contained there. Um, I'm going to cover a few different areas of law as I as I just uh, mentioned. So the first is blockchain and the rules of evidence, uh, which is in itself a building block for thinking about the implications of blockchain for another a number of other areas of law. The second is to think about blockchain as a new contracting technology, uh, potentially a superior in some ways contracting technology and what the implications of that are in particular for an old but very, very important literature on the boundary of the firm. The third thing is to think about tokenization, ICOs and some of the issues to do with securities law around that, which have seen, received a lot of practical attention. Uh, that leads to a related topic, which is thinking about tax law in the context of DLT. And then the last two move a little further afield, but are overarching and important areas. Uh, the, the penultimate one there is voting and election law and thinking not only about mobile voting, voting on uh, utilising blockchain technology, but also some of the broader areas around security and election law that are very important. And obviously in the United States with a very consequential election coming up uh, not too far away and in the context of COVID-19, we're voting in pres in, uh, you know, with one's physical presence involved is dangerous and potentially impossible uh, in a lot of circumstances that's gained increased interest for obvious reasons. Uh, and the last one is thinking about digital currencies. And I'll just touch on that really briefly. Uh, you know, there are people who are uh, far more expert in that than I, but uh, uh, there are some sort of interesting issues there about how regulatory agencies around the world are grappling with thinking about the potential for digital currencies to, to have an impact on the way that they regulate. So I'm starting off with blockchain and the rules of evidence. So if a fair, what should be a fairly uncontroversial statement is the blockchain tracks facts. Uh, now, an important and threshold question is whether those facts 
are admissible in a court of law, okay? And if they're, if they're not, um, that's going to have very different implications for, for instance, what can be contracted on uh, th than if they are admissible in a court of law. So the federal rules of evidence in the United States, and I apologise that even though uh, I'm recording this in Australia and uh, am an Australian, this is a rather US-centric talk. So I have a few things to say about other jurisdictions, but uh, I sort of ask for a blanket exemption for being US-centric up front. Uh, the federal rules of evidence state that non-testimonial evidence has to be authenticated, so documents and the like. Uh, and that implies that one has to show that uh, blockchain evidence is is authentic. There's also um, a, a, another rule under the Federal Rules of Evidence, sometimes called the Best Evidence Rule, which says that you have to provide the best available evidence. Okay, and typically that's going to be interpreted as being original evidence. Okay, and so there's a real question about whether blockchain evidence is original evidence or not. There's also the issue of hearsay. So anyone who's you know a big fan of Law and Order or the Good Fight or these kinds of um, things will we'll, we'll hear these things coming up all the all the time. And there's um, a, a famous and important test um, uh, in making determinations as to what's hearsay. Um, and the implication here is whether electronic records make an assertion by a human or whether they make it by a machine, and whether or not that's going to be hearsay or or not. Now. There's a, an, exemption, an exemption for regular business records that helps, but notwithstanding that, many states um, have passed legislation relatively recently to try and clarify matters and provide some, some certainty. So in Illinois, for instance, uh, there, there was an act called the Illinois Blockchain Technology Act that took effect at the start of this year that permits the use of blockchain in uh, transactions and proceedings but it needs to be accurately reproduced for all parties. So the uh, anonymity that comes with certain kinds of um, distributed ledger technology would, would run afoul in general of um, the Illinois law there, and that's got important implications, which I'll discuss later on. Um, Vermont has passed legislation. Arizona has is well, as well to include blockchain records. So has Ohio and Delaware, given its... Uh, very important status as, as a state where many uh, businesses are incorporated is obviously important and it allows organisations to maintain business records using what it describes as distributed electronic networks or databases. Okay, so when blockchain evidence is allowed, it opens the door to some interesting possibilities. And speaking as an economist, I'd say what it allows is for more states of the world to be able to be verified. You know, a lot of what contracting is from a, an economist perspective is thinking about allocating uh, actions to be taken and payments to be made in a state contingent way or depending on what's happening. Um, you know, and an insurance contract is perhaps the canonical example of something like that. If there's an accident uh, and a loss is incurred, then um, who pays what to whom and so on. Okay, so this is going to impact on contracting opportunities, which is the next topic. Now, this, this, um, these next few slides are based on a paper that Anoop and I wrote a few years ago uh, about blockchain and the holdup problem. So that, that paper does exist. Um, uh, and uh, it makes the following, it starts with the following observation, which has been made uh, by far more distinguished scholars before us, which is that roughly speaking, half of all of economic activity happens in markets and half takes place in firms. Now, the modern theory of the firm, which is known as property rights theory, for which Oliver Hart won uh, the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, um, highlights the value of importance of asset ownership. Okay, and what asset ownership does under property rights theory is it gives the owner of those assets residual rights of control. Okay, and what that does is encourage uh, investment that's relationship specific and it reduces haggling costs, okay? And that for property rights theorists uh, and for the modern understanding of the boundary of the firm determines the boundary of the firm, okay? It's about the uh, relative incentives that are provided for asset specific investments or reducing ex post 
frictions like haggling uh, that come from allocating the asset to different different owners. So that's very important for determining whether firms are vertically integrated or not, or in what direction they're vertically integrated and things like that. Now, smart contracts on a blockchain like Ethereum, for instance, uh, raises the prospect that more contracting tech, more, more states of the world might be able to be contracted on. If you think about that for just a moment, an immediate implication of that or corollary of that is that that's going to all else equal shift some activity, economic activity from firms to markets. If roughly speaking, one takes an economic transaction outside of the marketplace and performs it inside a firm. So it gives up on the magic of the price mechanism, but uses the virtues of the authority relationship inside a firm, then if you can do it better in a market, at the margin, some activities going to become more attractive in markets rather than firms is going to shift there. Um, now, the holdup problem to which I just referred uh, speaks to the issue of the, um, the kind of opportunities people can, or the opportunism that contracting parties can take advantage of when some states can't be contracted on. Okay, so when some contingencies like the quality of a good might be known to the contracting parties, but are hard to describe to a court of law, then um, there's going to have to be renegotiation after the fact. Now, once there's renegotiation after the fact, um, there's the possibility for haggling. And when that haggling goes on, that's going to lead um, to the benefits being split in some way and underinvestment by the owner of the asset. Okay. Now, maybe it's the case that smart contracting technologies can come, go some way um, to making more states of the world contractable and therefore alleviating the holdup problem. So changing the boundaries of the firm and potentially increasing the value of total economic output. So we go into that in more detail in the paper, but at this point, what I'd say is that the observation is basically this. A bunch of clever economic theorists some time after property rights theory was developed said, look, you can, instead of using a firm and asset ownership, you could write a contract that uses really smart, what are known as revelation mechanisms. If the contracting parties know, say, the quality of the good, then it'll be in neither of their individual interest to reveal that, or it won't be in one of their individual interests typically, to tell the truth to a third party like a court. But if you construct a game form or a mechanism in the language of mechanism design with just the right sequence of announcements and penalties, depending on exactly what's said by both parties, then you can end up having truth telling being a result because people fear lying because of the consequences of the punishments they'll, they'll receive. Um, now, those are very, very clever mechanisms they're not, or at least they typically haven't been seen in reality, which raises a number of puzzles. Um, and one of those um, puzzles might potentially be resolved by blockchain technology. So this commitment up front to uh, have these punishments is not what economists will call time consistent. Once a punishment is called for by the mechanism, it would be in the interest of both parties to say, why are we... Why are we paying a big fine to some third party? Let's renegotiate and, and not pay the fine and keep that money for ourselves. And there should be a way to renegotiate that makes us both better off. But anticipating that, the punishments no longer serve their purpose. Um, and that's a bit of a conundrum. Now, one of the things that smart contracts can do is obviously provide both anonymity and therefore commitment power. Okay, so you might not be able to renegotiate a cleverly designed smart contract as long as the parties can't make side um, payments that are verifiable by the code of the contract. Um, so it might lead to the situation where a court can't reverse uh, penalty payments um, or penalty clauses. Now, those penalty clauses are often unenforceable by courts of law. They're sometimes called liquidated damages or stipulated damages. Um, but uh, if there's anonymity through a smart contract, then those things actually may work. Now, there's lots of issues about what happens if you get the code a bit wrong and you want to suddenly reverse things and, and lots of things like that. But as a thought experiment, it's an interesting one because it raises the possibility that there may be the possibility um, of 
these clever mechanisms that economists introduced actually being able to be uh, used in reality. And the big implication of that is that more trend, more economic activity might play t- take place in markets, in arm's length market contractual situations rather than inside firms. Moving on to tokenization and, and ICOs, there's obviously been a real proliferation of ICOs um, of, of many different types in recent years, utility tokens, asset tokens, payment tokens. The key issue for securities law is whether tokens are securities or not. If they're securities under the relevant definition, and I've extracted that here from the Securities Act of 1933, um, if they are, then they have to be registered with the SEC unless an exemption is is provided. It also means that the inter- intermediaries that deal in them need to be registered with the SEC or receive an exemption. And even the place where the tokens are sold has to be registered. So there's a, there's a large incentive for um, people involved in, in ICOs and related transactions to do with tokens to get around this and, and not have them be viewed as securities. And that's an ongoing practical debate There's a long definition there that I won't read, but the bolded type there uh, refers to a carve out to do with an investment contract. And that becomes a very important term for figuring out uh, whether tokens are securities. So what is an investment contract? Well, the the, um, the, uh, courts of the United States decided this a long time ago uh, in a case in 1946, Uh, all to do with something seemingly very mundane but now has broader implications, the sale of land and contract to pick oranges, sell the juice and share profits. Now, um, the Securities Act says that unless a registration statement is in effect as to a security, it's unlawful for any person, either directly or indirectly, to make use of any means or instruments of transportation or communication in interstate commerce um, or, or the mails to sell such a security uh, through the use of a medium prospectus or otherwise, okay? So the real question is, what is an investment contract? And there's many elements to the test, okay? There's uh, what the contract looks like, whether um, there's money being invested, whether it's a common enterprise, uh, either vertically or horizontally, whether there's an expectation of profit or whether there's a fixed return, so whether it looks more like debt or equity in some sense, um, and whether it's done solely through the efforts of others. The key thing to note here, and it's a recurring theme that I want to come back to drawing together many of these different aspects that I'm talking about, is that the US courts, but not so much courts in other jurisdictions, typically try to look to the ec- what they call the economic reality, what has been termed the economic realities of the transaction. And that, that's very important both um, in, in terms of thinking about what is going to be in this fairly narrow instance deemed an investment contract and hence a, hence a security or not um, in the US uh, and also whether um, various other instruments are going to be going to be seen one way or another relative to existing legal doctrine. So the substance, the economic reality is very important in the US, but not um, quite so much in other jurisdictions. Okay, Um, now, so the point that I just made there on that bolded bullet point is that design choices here are interacting with legal rules. People designing tokens, people designing ICOs uh, with tokens naturally involved in them, Um, are making design choices for economic reasons, but they're also changing or affecting at least how how their tokens are going to be viewed by the court. So if you make things more decentralised than they might otherwise optimally be, um, that might be, be good in one sense in terms of something not being considered a security, but it may be economically damaging. So there's a trade off there. Okay, so might one want to, in a sense, damage the functionality of utility tokens in order for them not to be seen as a security. Uh, Moving on to tax law, um, Anoop and I wrote a a piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago, um, just pointing out that with the rise of cryptocurrencies, if they were to be um, come to replace cash, which, you know, may well be the case uh, in some meaningful way, then that would give rise to a whole lot of issues to do with how things are taxed. And so, um, you know, Stephen Mnuchin, who's 
Treasury Secretary of the United States said some time ago that Bitcoin could become what he termed the next Swiss bank account. But here's a slightly more sophisticated tax tax dodge, which it would be very hard for the IRS to prove. So suppose A, B and C are hypothetical electronic addresses that you own uh, and you let the IRS know that you own A, but not that you own B and C. Okay, and you buy one, say Bitcoin, or pick your favorite cryptocurrency at $15,000 and you park it in vehicle A or address A, expecting the price to go up. And then just a few hours later, suppose Bitcoin's gone up in value to $15,500, you'll see this can be made to work either way. You send, you send that Bitcoin to B and then B sends it to C. Now down the track, when your Bitcoin, you know, say is worth $25,000, um, you can send it back to A and tell the IRS, uh, if you're an unscrupulous type who uh, doesn't mind lying to the IRS, I sold a Bitcoin to an anonymous counterparty B back at $15,500 and just now bought a Bitcoin from another anonymous counterparty that's got nothing to do with me, um, unbeknownst to the IRS it does, at C for $25,000. So as a result, you owe taxes on capital gains of just five hundred dollars rather than of ten thousand dollars and now um, the IRS can observe all the transactions between a B and C on the blockchain but it can't disprove that B and C are um, arm's length counterparties okay and so the rules in the US uh, that require financial institutions to verify the identities the um, you know your customer rules and such um, don't solve the problem as far as the IRS knows, B and C could have been set up by a foreign institution that doesn't comply with those rules. So that leaves you with a bit of a conundrum. You know, do you try and ban cryptocurrencies, which might be hard and unappealing for other reasons? Um, another way of thinking what the implication of this is, it could spark a move away from income and capital taxes to more consumption or value-added taxes, for instance. So that's a live debate along with the rest of the, the tax debate. Um, Moving on to the penultimate topic I want to touch on, voting and election law. Um, Distributed ledger technology has already begun to be used for um, security purposes in in online voting. So online voting is permitted under some circumstances in 32 US states now. um, And West Virginia was the first state to permit mobile voting in a federal election in 2018. Um, Now, this has the potential to increase voter turnout and also have a meaningful effect on election outcomes, but it raises important questions about security and hacking and paper trails and the very important issue of the overall integrity of elections. Now, on a slightly different topic that had nothing to do with blockchain per se, but everything to do with voter registration, a paper that I recently published um, with Roshana Bhatt and my UNSW colleague, Jenny Dechter, um, we used a natural experiment in um, Massachusetts in litigation under what's known as the Motor Voter Act, the National Motor Voter Registration Act, um, which basically requires uh, states to allow people to register to vote easily when they get a driver's license. And Massachusetts was found for a period of time to not be, not be adequately complying with that. And they had to do, serve a little penance for that by going on essentially a voter registration drive. And we were able to utilize that random event uh, alongside uh, it not occurring in nearby states to use a, uh, what economists call a difference in differences and in fact a differences in differences in differences strategy um, to find out what the causal effect of lowering voter registration costs is on voting. And we we found that it leads to much higher registration, which is not surprising, but the magnitude is is large. The conditional on being registered, people turn out at the same rate, but these people um, who were not previously registered, even though this is randomly done, so it's not a, a democratic voter drive, but it does skew towards lower socioeconomic status voters um, or potential voters, they're much more likely to vote Democrat. Now, mobile voting doesn't work so much on the registration margin, but on the turnout margin. But um, one might speculate that a similar thing uh, could, could occur. And certainly that is arguably behind some of the lawsuits being pursued and that have been pursued by 
uh, Republic, the Republican Party and, and, um, and some of their affiliates uh, who have been wanting to ban even things like vote by mail and so on. And that's going to be a pretty live issue going forward. And you can see uh, why distributed ledger technology might be a, an interesting defence against the idea of there being fraud with uh, vote by mail, although there doesn't seem to be any real evidence of fraud in, in vote by mail, um, as Judge Posner uh, ruled uh, in a Seventh Circuit Court ruling a few years ago. But... Um, uh, distributed ledger technology could in principle be even more immune to those considerations. So it's going to play a very important role going forward. And because it has a potential political skew, not by intent, but uh, just by implication, um, th th that's going to be a very charged issue. And, and one can expect more of that going forward. And election law will have to adapt to those circumstances. The final thing I'm going to touch on is digital currencies and international law might be a bit uh, of an overstatement there, but aspects of uh, conflicts of laws and, and other things of an international nature. So uh, as many people would know, uh, th there's been a real movement towards the idea of private digital currencies in recent times, um, starting with the idea of uh, stable coins, um, you know, that were, were fed back like tether, although, again, there are issues, <laughs> uh, to put it politely there, that I won't go into here, um, and, and, and other um, commodity-backed, uh, potentially stable coins. But, you know, I'm thinking here of something like Libra, which would be, if it were to, um, you know, reach its full potential, be obviously uh, a, a dramatically different kind of thing. I like to think of those things, something like a potential Libra, as having two different components, a payments component and a currency component. So the payments component is essentially competition for Apple Pay and Google Pay, um, you know, maybe they don't charge anything for it, but they hold on to your cash, which has value even in a very low interest rate environment. Um, uh, you're going to get zero interest, zero basis points in interest on that. They get something about the opportunity cost of it to them, which is probably positive. So that's valuable as a business uh, endeavor. There's also the currency component. Um, and this thing would have an exchange rate with say the US dollar or the euro or the Australian dollar or the Japanese yen. And you could imagine that that would lead to um, the, the, if you like, the governing authority of that digital currency having the ability to dump a country's currency. And that would give it potentially significant power if it were to, to do that and the potential to extract concessions in other related businesses. Okay, so this relates to, to a current paper of mine with Robert Akalov, who's at Warwick, and Luis Reyes at Northwestern, uh, used to be a colleague of mine at Chicago, um, uh, that's under, under revise and, and resubmission at the Journal of Political Economy. And um, there, what we show is in markets with network externalities, um, so think of the platform markets, obviously something like Uber or Amazon or Facebook or many, 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 many others, where the more people are on it, the more attractive it is for you to be on it. Uh, potentially on both sides of the, the market, um, can lead to a situation where you have in firms and out firms where you can have somebody with very, very high market share. They may not have a great deal of market power in that market, but they may have power in auxiliary markets. And that's very relevant for thinking about these things. Um, the regulatory implications of that are um, that the whole transmission mechanism and therefore functionality of monetary policy could be under threat from this. There are questions about what reserve requirements might be required, whether something like Libra would be considered a deposit-taking institution and subject to that, that um, type of regulation, whether there'd be tax leakage, uh, you know, what powers the SEC might have, whether a, one of these proposed digital authorities might have power to regulate. So many implications, which many people have discussed. And in, again, in the paper, we'll go into that in a lot more detail and really just giving you a flavour of the topics here. So I think the perspective that we take is that there's a meaningful and important interaction between legal rules and distributed ledger technology. The design choices that affect um, that are made affect the legal position of these uh, of these contracts and instruments and objects, and vice versa. The legal design affects how how the instruments are designed. Um, what uh, distributed ledger technology does and how it's treated by the law are essentially co-determined. And that's important to keep in mind. Now, uh, in the US, 
the general approach is to look at economic substance, uh, that's in no small part a consequence of the law and economics movement, which people like um, Guido Calabresi and Dick Posner really pioneered, uh, in a sense, on the back of Ronald Coase's very important contributions um, for the last, you know, over the last four or five decades. Um, that's very far from the general approach in other jurisdictions, like in Western Europe or my home country of Australia. That presents its own challenges and its own opportunities. But I think this is an area where this co-determination of the design of these technologies and the design of legal rules and instruments is going to be terribly important. Thank you for your time.